Esta poesía se la voy a dedicar al que vive en el recuerdo. Su título es La pena negra, de Federico García Lorca. Federico García Lorca, perhaps Spain's greatest poet and dramatist of this century, was executed 50 years ago in the early days of the Spanish Civil War, aged 38. There remain some fragments of black and white film, photographs, Lorca's drawings and writings, but so far, no recording of his voice has ever been found. Loco wasn't just a poet, he, he was an excellent pianist, for example. He, he sang folk songs, he, he drew very well. He was an amazing dramatist, he, he was an actor. He directed plays and, and set up a traveling theatre called the Barraca, under the Republic, taking classical plays out to the villages, the lonely villages of Castile and Galicia. He seemed to be capable of everything. He, he was a magic, charismatic figure. Ian, why do you think that you, an Irish writer, became so involved in the life of a Spanish poet? Well, no, I wasn't really an Irish writer when I began to, to work on Lorca. It's working on Lorca that made me an Irish writer. Uh, I went to Lorca to, rather, rather, to write a thesis on, on Lorca. I was already interested in his work. And I went to Granada, in Andalusia, where he was born. And I spent the first few months of my time there going out into the Vega, Granada's fertile plain, talking to people in Lorca's village, talking to people down by the rivers in the fields, looking for the sources of his work. But people kept talking to me about his death. And I realized that nobody in Granada had forgotten the horrors of the mass executions that took place in the town. I remember driving out along this road. I mean, rather frightened because in those days, the civil guard still patrolled the road and they're always on the lookout for foreigners snooping and asking about Lorca. Hombre, es fascinante lo que nos está contando. Ver, yo le estoy contando gente, lo, lo que he vivido. Y la gente, dígame una cosa, que la gente de Biznar dice que en el barranco hay 4.000 muertos. ¿4.000? Que lo digo yo. Pero que ¿cómo lo... puede haber en un sitio que no es tampoco enorme? No, tan... no es enorme, pues allí hay mmm, 600 y pico metros de fosa. Joder. Sí. de fosa, yeah. porque yo los he medido y porque las conozco y porque las he visto antes y después. The fact is that for many years no one knew, among all the thousands killed in Granada, where Lorca's body had been buried. He cerrado mi balcón porque no quiero ir el llanto pero por detrás de los grises muros no se oye otra cosa que el llanto. Hay muy pocos ángeles que canten, hay muy pocos perros que ladren. Mil violines caben en la palma de mi mano. And one day I woke up and I knew that I was going to write a book on his assassination, on what had happened not only to him, but to thousands of other people in Granada, and shelved the thesis. The thesis, I might add, is still shelved somewhere there, and uh, what was going to be a thesis became a book. And it was a great success, because we now know that Franco had only five years left to live, the regime was cracking, and people were avid in Spain to hear about what had happened during the war, because the book is not just about Lorca's death, but about what actually happened in Granada. And since then, it's gone on from strength to strength. I think it's been published in 14 languages, which shows you how interested people are in Lorca. Yo nunca fui a Granada, nunca vine a Granada hasta mucho más tarde, hasta 1984. Voy a decir el poema que yo le escribí a Federico, Balada del que nunca fue a Granada. Lorca's great friend and contemporary, the poet Rafael Alberti, has always deeply regretted not having taken up Federico's invitation to visit him in Granada. He remained in exile until Franco's death and finally made the trip to Granada in 1984.
balada del que nunca fue a Granada, que lejos por mares, campos y montañas, ya otros soles miran mi cabeza cana, nunca fui a Granada, mi cabeza cana los años perdidos, quiero hallar los viejos borrados caminos, nunca vi Granada, dale un ramo verde de luz a mi mano, una rienda corta y un galope largo, Nunca entré en Granada, qué gente enemiga puebla sus adarves, que en los claros secos libres de sus aires, nunca fui a Granada, que en hoy sus jardines aprisiona y pone cadenas al habla de sus surtidores, nunca vi Granada, venid los que nunca fuisteis a Granada, hay sangre caída, sangre que me llama, nunca entré en Granada, hay sangre caída del mejor hermano. People are letting off fireworks with tremendous excitement as they celebrate the life of the greatest poet ever born in Granada. If Lorca hadn't been assassinated, he would have been 88 today. And the people of his village, of Fuente Vaqueros, have gathered to do him homage 50 years after his assassination at the hands of the fascists in Granada. It was in Fuente Vaqueros I first saw the light of day. In all the vigor of Granada, and this is not mere exaggeration. There is no other village so attractive, so prosperous, and with such capacity for feeling as this one. And beyond the stage, there in the corner of the square, is the house where Lorca was born in Fuente Vaqueros on the 5th of June, 1898. He was born into a, a large and privileged family. His father was a wealthy landowner who had made a huge amount of money from sugar beet at the turn of the last century when Spain lost Cuba and there was no longer any cheap sugar flowing into Spain. Federico spent 11 years immersed in the village life of the Vega, and this put him into contact with the ordinary people who were working on the land, the people of the fields, the farm workers, the peasants, and even with a colony of gypsies who sang the deep song, Cante Hondo, the ancient music of Andalusia. I see so fre, so fre, Bebe el agua tranquila de la canción añeja, arroyo claro, fuente serena. ¿Por qué te vas tan lejos de la plazuela? Voy en busca de magos y de princesas. ¿Quién te enseñó el camino de los poetas? La fuente y el arroyo de la canción añeja. My very earliest emotional experiences are associated with the land and the work on the land. My whole childhood was centered on the village. Shepherds, fields, sky, solitude, total simplicity. It's not often that we approach life in such a natural, straightforward fashion. Looking and listening. I was a curious child, and I followed our vigorous plough all over the fields. I liked seeing how the huge steel blade could open incisions in the earth and draw forth roots instead of blood. On one occasion, the plough hit something solid and stopped. The shiny steel blade was pulling up a Roman mosaic so that the first artistic wonder I ever felt was connected with Earth. The whole of Andalusia is like a, an archaeological site, composed of layer upon layer of different cultures and civilizations. Lorca knew this and was fascinated by it. And he was living only a few miles away from Granada, the last bastion of Islamic culture in Spain. The contemplative man goes to Granada to be all alone in the breeze of sweet basil, dark moss, and trilling nightingales exhaled by the old hills near that bonfire of saffron, deep grey and blotting paper pink, the walls of the Alhambra. 
to be alone, to ponder an atmosphere full of difficult voices, in an air so beautiful it is almost like thought. And the civilization that produced the Alhambra was destroyed by the Christians in 1492. It was a terrible moment, though they teach just the opposite in the schools. An admirable civilization was lost, with poetry, astronomy, architecture, and delicacy unequaled anywhere in the world, in order to make way for a poor, cowardly, tight-fisted city, stirred up at present by the worst bourgeoisie in all Spain. The sepulchres of the Catholic kings have not kept the Islamic crescent from showing at times on the chest of Granada's finest sons. The dark struggle continues without being expressed. On the Colina Roja are two dead palaces, the Alhambra and the palace of Carlos V, which continue to fight the fatal duel throbbing in the heart of every Granadan. Mas la Granada es la sangre, sangre del cielo sagrado, sangre de la tierra herida por la aguja del regato, sangre del viento que viene del rudo monte arañado. La granada es la prehistoria de la sangre que llevamos, la idea de sangre encerrada en glóbulo duro y agrio que tiene una vaga forma de corazón y de cráneo. The water of Granada slakes our thirst. It is living water that becomes part of whoever drinks it or hears it or wants to die in it. Mi corazón reposa junto a la fuente fría. Llénalo con tu giro, araña del olvido. El agua de la fuente su canción le decía, llena con tu silo, araña del olvido. Mi corazón despierto sus amores decía, araña del silencio, tejele tu misterio. El agua de la fuente lo escuchaba sombría, araña del silencio, tejele tu misterio. Mi corazón se vuelca sobre la fuente fría, manos blancas, lejanas. Detened a las aguas y el agua se lo lleva cantando de alegría, manos blancas, lejanas. Nada queda en la agua. Es una foto que yo creo que da admirablemente la figura de Federico. Señala al mismo tiempo el poder y el valor de esa cabeza y al mismo tiempo la debilidad del cuerpo. Por eso me gusta tanto también la postura, la postura de las manos. ¿no? Esa postura de las manos que también están subrayando su debilidad. Nosotros hemos tenido la suerte de oírle a él leer sus propios poemas. Él tiene una voz caudalosa, redonda, embastecida, como un cadáver de agua. Él, él recitaba exactamente igual que hablaba. No te conoce nadie, no, pero yo te canto, yo canto para luego tu perfil y tu gracia, 
la madurez insigne de tu conocimiento, tu apetencia de muerte y el gusto de su boca, la tristeza que tuvo tu valiente alegría. Tardará mucho tiempo en nacer si es que nace un andaluz tan claro, tan rico de aventura. Yo canto su elegancia con palabras que gimen y recuerdo una brisa triste por los olivos. I think that Lorca wouldn't be the Lorca we know today if he hadn't met Manuel de Falla. And if Falla hadn't, to a certain extent, taken him under his wing, a sort of second father. He was in his 40s, he looked like a man in his 60s. And he was Spain's most famous living composer. Falla hears Lorca playing the piano in this very house where we're sitting. And he's just amazed that any boy of his age could have such a genius. I think that Lorca was aware that Falla was a deeply frustrated man, uh, that if he hadn't expressed this in his music, he would have died. When I mean, you listen to Falla's music, you say, this is the passionate Dionysian man. But you look at the life, the external life, and Falla is trotting off to mass every morning and seems to be incredibly Catholic and worried about sin. When Falla heard that Lorca, his friend, whom he admired so much, whom he loved so much, had been arrested and was in danger, he went down to the town to talk to the civil governor and to intercede on Lorca's behalf. And they say that when he arrived there, he went in and asked. They told him that Lorca had already been shot, and that he came out weeping. He was just destroyed. He fell to pieces. In Nights in the Gardens of Spain, which I think is probably the piece of music by Falla most well known, there are several folk songs which are re elaborated by the composer to produce this new music. This is what Lorca does at one level in his work. <laughs> I think that what Falla taught him more than anything was to look at the Andalusian tradition, to realize that he himself had this tradition in his blood. That, for me, is the, is the amazing consequence of their friendship. They felt that the pure essence of Cantejondo, or deep song, was being lost. And together they organized in 1922 a competition for singers of flamenco. I'm going to say flamenco. Although really, flamenco is the modern version of what is a very ancient tradition. The maestro Manuel de Falla pride of Spain and soul of this festival, declares that Cantejondo is perhaps the only form of song on our continent that has preserved in all its purity, both structural and stylistic, the most important characteristics of the primitive song of Oriental peoples. We are indebted to the gypsies for building these lyrical channels through which all the pain, all the ritual gestures of the race can escape. great artists of southern Spain, gypsy or flamenco, whether they sing, dance or play, know that no real emotion is possible unless there is that form of inspiration we call duende. Duende is not in the throat. Duende surges up from the soles of the feet. 
which means that it is not a matter of ability, but of real, living form. <laughs> The true poems of deep song belong to no one. They float in the wind like golden thistledown, and each generation dresses them in a different color and passes them on to the next. Empieza el llanto de la guitarra. Se rompe las copas de la madrugada. Empieza el llanto de la guitarra. Llora por cosas lejanas. Arena del sur caliente que pide camelias blancas. Llora flecha sin blanco, la tarde sin mañana. Y el primer pájaro muerto sobre la rama. Oh, guitarra. Corazón mal herido por cinco espadas. La guitarra is from a sequence of poems inspired directly by Cante Hondo, Deep Song. And the culmination of this interest was the Gypsy Ballads, the Roman Gitano, published in 1928, which is certainly Lorca's most famous book of poems. They're tapping a traditional source, but adding elements that derive from the 20th century. And Spaniards listening to these ballads recited grasped immediately that these are traditional poems with a modern flavor. La piqueta de los gallos viene encabando la aurora Cuando por el monte oscuro baja Soledad Montoya Cobre amarillo su carne Huele a caballos y a sombra Yunques ahumado su peso Gimen canciones redondas Soledad, por quien pregunta, se acompaña ya a estas horas. Pregunte por quien pregunte, dime, ¿a ti qué te importa? Vengo a buscar lo que busco, mi alegría y mi persona. Soledad de mis pesares, caballo que se desboca, al fin encuentra la mar y se lo tragan las olas. No me recuerdes la mar, que la pena negra brota. En la tierra de aceituna, entre el rumor de la soja. El río baja cantando, volante de azul y hoja. Con flores de calabaza, la nueva luz se corona. Oh pena de los gitanos, pena limpia y siempre sola. Oh pena de cauce oscuro. Y madrugada remota. He loved the earth, the mountains and the rivers, and his imagery draws its strength from observed reality. In a way, he's a very realistic poet, and the uh, metaphors that seem complex, beneath the complexity, there's always this direct physical contact. Right now, I'm in the Huerta de San Vicente, in the plain of Granada. There is so much jasmine and nightshade in the garden that every morning we all wake up with lyrical headaches. And yet, nothing is excessive. That's the amazing thing about Andalusia. The Huerta de San Vicente, St. Vincent's Orchard, was the Lorca's summer residence. In those days, before the war, the Huerta was on the outskirts of Granada. So when you look from here up towards the town, the, gra the ground gradually rose and rose until you could see at the end the Alhambra and the Generalife. Now, of course, these wretched capitalists have thrown up this appalling row of tall blocks of houses. 
he was a poet, which is a disgraceful thing to be in a grenadine bourgeois setting. And you know, he, he very badly wanted to be a professional musician, and the family was opposed to that. His parents thought that his, their children should have university careers, the careers that they hadn't had, and they insisted that Lorca should have a university career. So he eventually finishes his law degree with the help of several benevolent professors. People say that his father only understood in 1933 just how brilliant his son was when Lorca sent a, a check from Buenos Aires when his plays were a great success and he sent a huge check to his father. His father opened the check and said, Hombre, el niño, el niño vale mucho. My boy is doing well. But I suspect they didn't really, really understand who Federico was. Lorca's mother had been a primary school teacher before she married and she set very high standards for her children. She despaired of Federico, who was hopeless academically, and like his younger brother Francisco, who always came first in everything. They were all musicians. They were wonderful people in the family, people who could play the piano without ever having learned to play the piano, Pe people who could play musical instruments, people who could recite poetry, invent poems, uh, and Lorca was the fine flowering of that Garcia family. This is Lorca's bedroom, and it's where he, where he wrote. This marvelous balcony looking out over the garden, over the Sierra Nevada, and the desk at which he wrote Blood Wedding, while listening to a cantata by, by Bach, Vaktet Auf, incessantly, all day and all night, it's said that he wrote the play in 15 days, virtually at a sitting, hardly sleeping, and just listening to this music. I must tell you that I hate the organ, the lyre and the flute. I love the human voice. I'm amazed when I consider that the emotion of composers like Bach is based on and sustained by a perfect mathematics. And above his desk hangs the poster of the Baraka, the university traveling theater company he directed. Of course, the Baraka was set up by the Republic. And when the idea arose to, to take plays to villages where no theater had ever been seen, Lorca was thought of as a potential director of the theatre, and of course it appealed to him greatly, the idea of taking plays and setting up theatres in the marketplaces of ancient Spain as part of the Republic's programme to educate people who had never been educated and who had never had the opportunity to see plays. Tonight I am not speaking as the playwright or the poet, but as an ardent, passionate believer in the theatre of social action. The theatre is one of the most expressive and useful instruments for building up a country. It is the barometer of its greatness or decline. Today's Barraca Theatre Company continues Lorca's mission, but actually it specialises in putting on Lorca's own plays, those plays of Lorca's especially, which derive from the tradition of Andalusian puppet theatre. Lorca decía que el teatro estaba en manos de los comerciantes y, y que así no se podía hacer teatro. También hay una diferencia, ellos hacían generalmente teatro clásico y nosotros hacemos exclusivamente teatro de Lorca. Porque, eh, porque bueno, entonces Lorca pensaba que no era correcto utilizar el dinero del Estado en, en estrenar sus propias obras. Bueno, también hay una diferencia. La barraca estuvo en su época subvencionada por el Estado. Nosotros no estamos subvencionados por el Estado. Y saludemos hoy en la barraca a don Cristóbal, el andaluz, primo del Bulubú Gallego, cuñado de la tía Lorica de El retablillo de Don Cristóbal es una obra que hacemos en realidad para los niños, pero también para todos los públicos. Pero los niños especialmente la, la entienden muy bien. 
y es, está escrita originalmente para Guiñol, como una farsa, y, y queremos conservar un estilo muy inocente, muy ingenuo, como el teatro que Federico hacía cuando era niño, que eh, hacía Guiñol en, en su casa, en el jardín, con sus primas. ¡Ay, qué jamoncitos tiene por delante y por detrás! What about his school days? Were they happy? Yeah, I think that other people felt that he was marvelously happy, but in some of the early poems he says, for example, there's one poem called Ballada Triste, a sad ballad. In the poem he addresses himself to these children, and he says, Yo siempre fui intranquilo, niños buenos del Prado. I was always uneasy as a child. Lorca was capable of uh, immense happiness, but beneath that, there was a tragic sense of life. When Lorca became aware that he, he wasn't like most of his other male friends, when he became aware of his homosexuality, there's no doubt that he suffered agonies. When a subject is too lengthy or contains a poetically stale emotion, I resolve it with drawing. They are not good. At times I despair. I see that I'm not fit for anything. Perhaps one day I will be able to express the extraordinary, real drawings that I dream. Over his bed, he had a painting of the Virgin of the Seven Sorrows. I think he, he loved the Virgin, the Mother of God, that mother who's so lacking in the Protestant tradition, the mother who, who knew that her son was to be crucified, the mother who understands about suffering, the soft mother, quite different to the harsh authoritarian father, uh, God that Lorca rejected during his adolescence. Walker never lost his childhood love of the rituals and ceremonies of the Catholic Church, and you've only got to see a, a Holy Week procession to understand why. For him, it was pure theatre. And, of course, he was also intrigued by the sexual ambiguity of many of the Church's saints and martyrs. San Miguel, lleno de encajes en la alcoba de su torre, enseña sus bellos mulos ceñidos por los faroles. San Miguel canta en los vidrios, efebo de tres mil noches, fragante de agua colonia y lejano de las flores. One of Lorca's early biographers, who knew him very well, Marcelo Clerc, and she said that the greatest cross that Federico had to bear in life was to hide from his mother the fact of his homosexuality. I too am accustomed to suffer for things that people don't understand or suspect. Between one person and another, there are spider threads that little by little turn into wires and even bars of steel. When death separates us, there remains a bloody wound in the place of each thread. Porque duerme solo, pastor. Porque duerme solo, pastor, en mi colcha de lana dormirías mejor. Frustration, erotic frustration, people searching for their identity, unable to find it. All these characters in Lorca who are searching for love and never find it. I mean, I could give you a catalogue beginning in the early poems, running right through Doña Rosita, uh, the characters in Blood Wedding, and Yerma, Yerma herself. Tu colcha de oscura piedra, pastor. Y tu camisa de escarcha, pastor. Juncos grises del invierno, la noche de tu cama. Los robles ponen agujas, pastor. Debajo de tu almohada, 
pastor. Y si oyes voz de mujer es la rota voz del agua. Pastor, pastor, ¿qué quiere el monte de ti, pastor? Monte de hierbas amargas, ¿qué niño te está matando? La espina de la retama. But I think the women in Lorca, who tend to be the protagonists of his work, they're real women of flesh and blood. They're not just uh, homosexuals masked as women. But I think that Lorca's predicament as a homosexual in that terribly intolerant society uh, helped him to understand the sufferings of other people, and particularly, particularly of Spanish women. Para vivir en paz se necesita estar tranquilo. Si tú no lo sabes, no lo estoy. desvía la intención. Se no conoces mi modo de ser. Las ovejas en el redil y las mujeres en su casa. Tú sales demasiado. No me has oído decir esto siempre. Justo. Las mujeres dentro de sus casas cuando las casas no son tumbas. Cuando las sillas se rompen y las sábanas de hilo se gastan con el uso. Pero aquí no. Cada noche cuando me acuesto encuentro mi cama más nueva, más reluciente, como si estuviera recién traída de la ciudad. Tú misma reconoces que debo razonar. Que tengo motivos para estar alerta. ¿Alerta de qué? En nada te ofendo. Vivo sumisa a ti y lo que sufro lo guardo pegado a mis carnes. Y cada día que pase será peor. Is there something in the theme of Yerma which was perceived as attacking Spanish society? You know, another poet, Antonio Machado, said there are two Spains, huh? like that, completely separate and enemies. And Yerma, just this beautiful poem about a woman who don't have a baby, who can't have a baby, was so, such a provocation for this Spain black and terrible that even during the life of Lorca he was very, very hated, very. In all his plays, there is a, a strong felt of freedom and justice and, and sexuality, all the very dangerous things. Ay, qué prado de pena. Ay, qué puerta cerrada la hermosura. Que pido un hijo que sufrir. Y el aire me ofrece dalias de dormida luna. Esos dos manantiales que yo tengo de leche tibia son en la espesura de mi carne dos pulsos de caballo que hacen latir la rama de mi angustia. Much of his work is about frustration. Yes. Does that make him a pessimistic writer at all for you? No. I, no, I don't think so. When I, when I think about him, it's always about someone who is so helpful, hopeful, <laughs> lleno de esperanza, yeah. hopeful, 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 with uh, humor and love for the people, with a kind of loving regard about all of us. He's also a very passionate writer. Is that something that appeals to you as a performer? Yes, too, too. Because we are very passionate and very violent and all these primitive qualities. And, and he, he explained the very deep and subtle things in the middle of this passion and violence. Loco felt stifled in Granada, which was a narrow-minded city, and when he was 21, he managed to escape to Madrid. And in Madrid, the capital, he immediately felt at home. He came into contact with a wide range of new people, exciting people from, from the Spanish provinces and from Europe. And he lived at the Residencia de Estudiantes, the student's residence, the famous student's residence, which was the nearest thing in Spain to Knoxbridge College. Here's another wretched car. Mm. 
Andy was his home in Madrid. How would he be traveling? <laughs> Locke was terrified of driving, terrified of motor cars, terrified to cross the street. And he had a rather gammy left leg and was never seen to run in his life. He was terrified of crossing the street. Locke's relationship with Buñuel and Dali is absolutely vital, not only in Lorca's life, but in the life of the three of them. It is the most vital triangle in contemporary Spanish uh, art, I think. But, desde the luego, eran unas personalidades tremendas, sobre todo Federico García Lorca. La personalidad de García Lorca era rodeadora, era un, una, una cosa excepcional, hasta el extremo de que yo creo, y muchos opinan lo mismo, que la gran obra de arte de García Lorca era su propio yo, era sí, su verdad, persona, su personalidad, sí, sí, que sí. para mí sobrepasa su propia obra poética y teatral. Sí. De modo que, claro, era gente de, llena de ocurrencias y, en fin, que daba una vivacidad a la vida residencial extraordinaria. Dicen incluso y que cuando, Buñuel... Y cuando Federico se sentaba al piano en el salón de la residencia, pues, en fin, eso era ya... Él manaba música por todas partes. Entonces, cuando entraba en una reunión, él llevaba consigo el arrebato inmediatamente se convertía en el centro de atención de todos los sí, presentes. Sí, sí, y cuando se iba, había un descenso brusco sí. de altitud. La obra de la residencia y una influencia británica, evidentemente. Se bebían cantidades ingentes de té, por lo De té, se, se tomaba mucho té. Y otra costumbre Era británica, la ¿no? bebida, sí, sí. Se solían formar tertulias en las habitaciones y sí. el té era la bebida. El Orca tiene un dibujo. Lorca tiene un dibujo que llama la desesperación la del té, ¿no? Pero la gente pide más té, más té, más té. Each day I appreciate Dali's talent even more. He seems to me unique and he possesses a serenity and a clarity of judgment about whatever he's planning to do that is truly moving. He makes mistakes and it doesn't matter. He's alive. His denigrating intelligence combines with his disconcerting childishness in such an unusual way that it is absolutely captivating and original. Quizá conviene más acentuar lo que hay en la relación entre dos jóvenes con una vocación tan intensa como sintieron los dos y que llegará a tener valores recíprocos. De tal manera que Dalí va a hacer poesía y Federico va a hacer, a dibujar y a pintar. En todos esos años quedan los dos solos, la relación es constante. Y son muy frecuentes esto, la proyección de la imagen de Federico en, en los, la pintura y los dibujos de Dalí. Es, es el mismo Federico y la sombra de Federico, que eso nos permite identificar las muchas otras ocasiones en que aparece una sombra de rostro, de estructura cuadrada, que es la de Federico. Sí. Ahora bien, yo quiero llamar la atención sobre el hecho de que está con los ojos cerrados. Sí. Duerme, está muerto, por una cosa que cuenta Dalí, que es muy interesante en la residencia. Dice que Federico, al irse a acostar cada noche, antes a los amigos les representaba su muerte y su entierro en Granada. Iba, sí, sí, explicando, sí. iba explicando que moría en la cama, que lo desnudaban, que le ponían el sudario, que lo metían en el ataúd, y todos ellos aterrorizándose, aterrorizados, porque claro, es que él narraba, era un actor extraordinario. Y cuando lo tenía bien aterrorizado, daba un salto de alegría, reía y se iba y dormía como un santo, sí, sí. porque había descargado en los demás el terror a la muerte, claro, había... se había liberado pasando... Y esto... Es lo que pinta siempre eh, Salvador Dalí, el de, la descarga a través del sueño de la muerte, de la obsesión de la muerte, que es por lo visto a lo que se ve una obsesión muy española. No doubt that Buñuel was responsible for weaning Dali away from Lorca. Dali was very beautiful. Lorca was fascinated by him. And when Dali um, saw that Lorca wanted to make love to him physically, Dali became terrified because Dali, it seems, uh, couldn't accept his own homosexual tendencies. Buñuel was also a very complex character. 
Buñuel had problems about his own sexuality. He had uh, what one could call a pathetic virility complex, constantly bragging about his conquests and his performance in the leading brothels of Madrid. And they had this tremendously uh, deep relationship, which involved jealousy. A chien andalou, an Andalusian dog, it was made in 1929. This was at a point when Dali had moved to Paris and Buñuel was constantly criticizing Lorca in letters to other friends. Lorca himself believed that Dali and Buñuel had him very much to the forefront of their minds when they made the film and said to somebody in America, you know, Buñuel and Dali have made a little shit of a film which I appear. <laughs> June 1929. I'm leaving Granada for Madrid and from there to Paris, London, and then to New York. New York seems horrible, but for that very reason I'm going there. I am very well, with a new restlessness about the world and my future. The two elements that first strike the traveler in the big city are extra human architecture and furious rhythm geometry and anguish. The terrible, cold, cruel part is Wall Street. Rivers of gold flow from all over the earth and death comes with it. There as nowhere else you feel a total absence of the spirit. I was lucky enough to see with my own eyes the recent crash where they lost various billions of dollars, a rabble of dead money that slid into the sea. And never as then, amid suicides, hysteria, and groups of fainters, have I felt the sensation of real death. Death without hope, death that is nothing but rottenness, for the spectacle was terrifying, but devoid of greatness. He went because he knew that if he didn't get out of Spain at that moment, he wouldn't write the great poetry he wanted to write, which was a poetry more concerned with contemporary reality. Also, he was going through a period of depression because of some unhappy personal relationships. Todos los días se matan en New York. Cuatro millones de patos. Cinco millones de cerdos. Dos mil palomas para el gusto de los agonizantes. Un millón de vacas. Un millón de corderos y dos millones de gallos que dejan los cielos hechos añicos. Yo denuncio a toda la gente que ignora la otra mitad. La mitad irredimible que levanta sus montes de cementos, donde laten los corazones de los animalitos que se olvidan y donde caeremos todos en la última fiesta de los taladros. No, 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 yo denuncio. Yo denuncio la conjura de estas desiertas oficinas que no radian las agonías, que borran los programas de la selva y me ofrezco a ser comido por las vacas estrujadas cuando sus gritos llenan el valle, donde el Hudson se emborracha con aceite. To Philip Cummings, July 6, 1929. My dear friend, I was overjoyed to receive your letter. I found a place in New York. I've registered at Columbia University, and for this reason I can't be with you until six weeks from now. Oh. You, by the way, notice this. This was my permit to go into the Royal Palace grounds when I was living in Spain under that fellowship. I loved that. I could go everywhere. In fact, I walked with the Pope there, but not the present one, two or three popes ago. This is the only book I have of the ones I used to have several of that Lorca gave me when he was here and in his lifetime and in Eden. Oh, that's beautiful. This is his Romancero Gitano, his Gypsy Ballads. Can I read it? Of course. A mi queridísimo amigo Felipe, my dear friend Felipe, Con un abrazo estrecho, a firm embrace de su siempre amigo, his friend of always, Federico, 1929. 
Oh, that's beautiful. And that's the only book you've got to fill with. I three or four, but the others were borrowed, purloined, or otherwise. They disappeared. They disappeared. I more or less know where they are, but they're, somebody loves them. That's beautiful. Well, I'm very envious of it. I want to take you in a record, but I have to go in the, uh, another room to play the record because it's 78, of course. Where is it, in here? Yes, I'll get it. I'll just get out of your way for a second. One side is a little bit scratched, but it's a very old record, of course. This is the record with Lorca playing the yes. piano. Yes, and Anita singing. It's approximately 55 years old, of course. I met him first one day uh, in the Presidente uh, de de Piña 21, when after lunch he would go to the sala. Nobody went into the sala, they all went to have a, to a rest, a siesta. He was in there playing and I was so excited. I went and sat down and I grinned at him and he nodded at me and that was it. But he has a, a, a marvelous control. He has a beautiful control. Yes. She does a question, it's better than she does a singing. I found my old passport. That's my 1926 picture. So when he came to me, my father couldn't speak a word of Spanish to him, and he couldn't speak English, but we grinned and got into the Model T and drove up to Lake Eden. And he just was so glad to see the country. Country said, sin casas, no houses. No houses. No people, nothing. The Lorca is very formally dressed, isn't he, compared to you? Didn't he bring any more sort of loose fitting? Not much. Just the sweater. It's very much an English jersey, isn't it? De but uh, definitely bought in Oxford. Oh, definitely. Very handsome. And he obviously took to your mother very quickly. She got along she very to well him. together. Yeah. But they met over the common donut pail. She made him fresh donuts and he loved them. He said he was going to bring me a poem, a book of poems. He brought it. Mm -hmm. I said, Federico, it's wonderful. They've got to be put into English. She said, I can't. Should you do it? Well, my father had an old Oliver typewriter, and I sat down and went to work on it. I still type with type, two fingers ineffectively. But uh, we would argue. We'd argue right after breakfast, maybe with a big pot of tea or coffee or something. And we would argue about it. And while he wouldn't understand the exact English word, he knew the nuance. And I would translate what I thought of it. We had some quite fierce arguments for a while. And then uh, we would come to what he thought and I thought was a satisfactory result. Mm. That's why the Cantheos means so much to me, because it's a book which was published after we had translated it right with a poet sitting there. Cuando sale la luna de cien rostros iguales, la moneda de plata solloza en el bolsillo. That was very difficult for me to understand at first. And when the moon goes out with a hundred equal faces, the money of silver sobs in the pockets which is fantastic, because then the moon goes out and has been obliterated totally with the great clouds and everything now has become complete darkness, a, a velouté, the French would say, a velvety darkness. Then uh, everything looks alike. All the sounds are muffled into one common sound. Yeah, and the next, the next verse is, is tremendous, is it? When the moon image goes out, the sea covers the earth, and the heart feels itself an island in infinity. The landscape of Vermont is marvelous, but infinitely melancholy. It never stops raining. The family is very nice, full of gentle charm, but the woods and lakes immerse me in an almost unbearable state of poetic despair. He was so impressed with the deep stillness of it. Mm. He always said to me, Mi duende tiene siempre el agua. My fate has water in it. The bird is now a protected bird. It's a very really much of a haunted cry. But uh, it's a lonely cry. And the loneliness of the loon reached right to him very clearly because he was feeling lonely about many things. I never could quite encompass all the things he was lonely about. When he came to see you, he had already begun to write some poems of Negro inspiration. The King of Harlem 
had already been written. So he did, in a sense, find a subject before he came to Vermont. Well, I think you have to realize something that else is very important about that in Harlem. He was not interested in the Negro question as we have it in America. He was interested in his as a people apart. And he was thinking of those people in Spain, such as you wrote of in the Casa Maria, Alba, I mean, all of those, the people who are depressed. Yes. Either pushed down by the Guardia Civilis, or perhaps by an overdominant church. And he was, he was another people who pushed. He felt a kinship. And he was interested in them as symbols more than as actual. He was not, real interested, in the, he was not interested in the socialism of it, mm. political socialism. He was in the compassionate socialism. Yes. Human rights, we call it today. Many mornings I used to walk down from the university where I lived, changing from the frightful Mr. Locker of my professors into the strange, sleepy boy of the waitresses. And wanting to find out what they were thinking, I watched the blacks dance, for dance is the most unique and poignant expression of their feelings and pain. I hardly, I hardly, I hardly. No hay angustia comparable a tus rojos oprimidos, a tu sangre estremecida dentro del eclipse oscuro, a tu violencia granate sordomuda que en la penumbra, a tu gran rey prisionero con un traje de conserje. Es curioso porque una de las grandes sorpresas que indudablemente tuvo Federico al llegar a, fue el conocimiento, la toma de contacto con el mundo negro. El mundo negro con todo lo, lo que llevaba el mundo negro ¿no? consigo. Y que hablaba, dice, los negros lloraban confundidos entre paraguas y soles de oro. Los mulatos estiraban gomas, ansiosos de llegar al torso blanco. Y el viento empañaba espejos y quebraba las venas de los bailarines. Negro, 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 negro. These Cuban newspapers of the period, mm. they show, don't they, what an incredible impact Lorca made uh, in La Havana. And there you have Lorca newspaper. dressed all in white. Like it was, the, it was very fashionable at that time in Cuba. So. He said to his parents, "Me estoy poniendo a platanao. A platanao uh, is a platanao a word that is used frequently in Cuba. Yes, a platanao means when you really get uh, used to the to the rhythm and to the yeah. to the climate. That's right. You know, and you feel at ease. At ease. At ease. That's at it. ease with yourself and, that's, that's, and man. That's how he that's felt. Right. Mm -hmm. All his lectures were covered in the press. I remember when I was a student. One of the important uh, matters that was given to me was about Cante Hondo, and it was Federico's lecture what they they gave us to, to, to learn about Cante Hondo. Oh, really? Yes. Cante Hondo for us was not uh, only an academic or poetic lecture. Mm -hmm. He was talking to us about something that we had as well, exactly. in a different way. steps of the rumba, there is a, a strong influence of, uh, of the music and, of the, and the dance of the flamenco. Iré a Santiago, y con el rosa de Romeo y Julieta, iré a Santiago, mar de papel y plata de monedas, iré a Santiago, o Cuba, o ritmo de semillas secas, iré a Santiago, o cintura caliente y gota de madera, iré a Santiago, Arpa de troncos vivos, caimán, flor, flor de, de tabaco. tabaco. Flor de tabaco. It's a reference to the cigar boxes. I think this poem is important because in the 1930s, very few, very few Cuban poets and Cuban writers would really be aware of the importance, you know, of the African presence in Cuba. Only big talents like Nicolas Guillén our national poet. That is why I think Nicolas and Federico, although Federico was not a Cuban, they go together on the yeah. same road, you see, opening the way, the way of reality, of the, of the Cuban identity. Iré a Santiago, brisa y alcohol en las ruedas. Iré a Santiago, mi coral en la tiniebla. Iré a Santiago, el mar ahogado en la arena. Iré a Santiago, calor blanco, fruta muerta. Iré a Santiago, 
oh bovino frescor de cañavera, oh Cuba, oh curva de suspiro y barro, iré a Santiago. It's absolutely... It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. And of course, I know that Lorca, when he was a One. child, used to sing habaneras that his uh, aunt or That's right. cousins used to sing these, these songs. So I think he always wanted to go to Cuba. Yeah. I think that Cuba was a dream for Lorca, who was, of course, born in the very year of the Cuban War. I think it is true that if we want to find Lorca, we will have to go either to Andalusia or to Cuba. It's, it's, I think he was right. Yes. Spain is always moved by the duende, being a country of ancient music and dance. We are also a nation of death, a nation open to death. In every country, death has finality. It arrives and the blinds are drawn, not in Spain. In Spain, they are lifted. Many Spaniards live between walls until the day they die, when they are taken out into the sun. A dead person in Spain is more alive when dead than is the case anywhere else. His profile cuts like the edge of a barber's razor. Por las gradas subí Ignacio con toda su muerte a cuestas. Buscaba su hermoso cuerpo y encontró su sangre abierta. It is in bullfighting that the duende attains its most impressive character, because on the one hand it has to fight with death, which may bring destruction, and on the other with geometry, the fundamental basic measure of the spectacle. The bull has its orbit, the bullfighter his, and between orbit and orbit there exists a point of danger where lies the apex of the terrible game. I don't think he was a great bullfight man, a great aficionado. I think he was more interested in the mythology of bullfighting, the roots of the ceremony. I think that's what really gripped his imagination. He was horrified when his great friend Ignacio Sanchez Mejias was gored to death in 1934. Sanchez Mejias loved poetry and, and flamenco. And he was the only bullfighter ever to write a play about psychoanalysis. And out of his grief for his lost friend came one of Locke's greatest poems. Y el toro solo corazón arriba, a las cinco de la tarde. Cuando el sudor de nieve fue llegando a las cinco de la tarde. Cuando la plaza se cubrió de yodo a las cinco de la tarde. La muerte puso huevos en la herida. A las cinco de la tarde. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And Lorca came to believe that Ignacio died by an act of fate. The bull who killed him, and when Lorca discovered this, it came as a great shock, was called Granadino, from Granada. Si muero, dejad el balcón abierto. El niño come naranjas. Desde mi balcón lo veo. Si muero, dejad el balcón abierto. If I die, leave the shutters open. I'm sure he was referring to the shutters of this bedroom. I find it very difficult to imagine what it was like that day at the beginning of August once the Spanish Civil War had begun and a group of thugs arrived here in the garden. They came down this path, they arrived here, they knocked on the door, they were extremely violent and they hauled the whole family out here onto the terrace. And they were looking for the brothers of the caretaker and they got hold of the caretaker and they tied him to a cherry tree which was situated more or less where that indolent dog is lying now. And they tied him to the cherry tree and they stripped him to the waist. He was called Gabriel and they whipped him until he bled, screaming. 
and Lorca at that point rushed out and protested and went up to the sergeant and said, how dare you do this in this house? Who are you? What permission have you got to come here? And they kicked Lorca to the ground and they called him a filthy homosexual. And that evening Lorca became aware that now they knew he was in the huerta and that he was in danger. And so he rang his friend Luis Rosales, a young Phalanges poet, and begged him to, to come and talk to him and perhaps to take him to his house to protect him. And that very evening, Rosales came and took Lorca away. And Lorca left the Huerta de San Vicente never to return. De modo que cuando Lorca sale de vuestra casa para ir a su muerte, pasando por este cuadro, porque unos pocos días después le asesinan y se acabó para siempre la labor creativa de, de García Lorca. Sí, yo creo además que nadie puede saber lo que se ha perdido con él porque él estaba entonces en su momento de creación suma a mí Lorca estaba en la plenitud de sus facultades eh, a los 38 años He was taken from Luis Rosales' house in the early afternoon of the 16th of August and he was taken in a car to the civil government building, a very short distance, some 300 yards. And it's almost certain that he spent two and a half days in the civil government. Uh, Manuel de Falla tried to intervene on his behalf, but arrived too late. The Rosales family tried to intervene on his behalf, but apparently could do nothing. It seems that the civil governor got into contact with Seville, with the general Capo de Llano, to ask what he should do with Lorca, because obviously he knew that Lorca was a famous poet, and that there'd be a tremendous reaction to his death. And it seems that General Capitano said, yes, give him coffee, lots of coffee, was his little formula, his little way of saying, kill him. El otoño vendrá con caracolas, uva de nieblas y montes agrupados. Pero nadie querrá mirar tus ojos porque te has muerto para siempre. Porque te has muerto para siempre, como todos los muertos de la tierra. Como todos los muertos que se olvidan en un montón de perros apagados. No te conoce nadie. Cuando se hundieron las formas puras, Bajo el cri, cri de las margaritas, comprendí que me habían asesinado. Recorrieron los cafés y los cementerios y las iglesias, abrieron los toneles y los armarios, destrozaron tres esqueletos para arrancar sus dientes de oro. I was quite overcome, actually, thinking about Lorca and how he had traveled along this very road in a car, probably sensing that something dreadful was going to happen to him. We don't know if he, if he knew he was going to be shot, but Lorca had this feeling for death. We've got to imagine that this was very dark. It would have been two or three in the morning. Pudiera de pronto volverme vieja y tuviera la boca como una flor machacada, te podría sonreír y conllevar la vida contigo. Ahora, ahora déjame con mis clavos. Locke was greatly, greatly hated, you know, by the right wing in Granada. They disliked his work, particularly the play Yerma, which seemed to them to be an attack on traditionalist Catholic values. Also, he had the wrong friends. He was homosexual. And they didn't like his father either, because his father was a rich landowner who was very good to the people working on his farms, helped them, built houses for them, very generous man. And I think that they also, they also wanted to punish the father by killing the son. I think in those circumstances, in those days, when people were either right or left, the issue seemed very clear-cut. Lorca was anti-fascist, and he had sided with the Popular Front government although he was never a member of a political party. The car pulled into the little square of Bithnar and stopped in front of the gates. 
to the palace built here in the 18th century. And at the beginning of the war, it became Phalangist headquarters for this area of the province. La noche se puso íntima como una pequeña plaza. Guardias civiles borrachos en la puerta golpeaban. Verde, que te quiero, verde. Verde viento, verde rama. El barco sobre la mar y el caballo en la montaña. was taken across the valley out there to his death from the colonia. All that remains of the building, the tiled floor of the room where Lorca spent those last few hours. Hundreds of people came here to their death. According to that guard to whom I've spoken, when Lorca realized that he was going to be shot, he leapt to his feet and screamed, you know, I'm innocent, I've done nothing, I'm a Catholic. Uh, and then he asked to be confessed, and the priest had gone. And this guard, who was very Catholic, uh, helped, him to, helped him to pray. And then apparently he became rather calm and entertained, entertained the other people who were in that room. The, the lame, the one-legged uh, school teacher, and the two bullfighters, and apparently he went calmly to his death. A las cinco de la tarde. Lo demás era muerte y solo muerte. Locke's work is full of streams and water, and it's ironic that he spent his last few hours listening to this stream, a stream that flows out of a nearby spring called the Fuente Grande. The bubbles rise continually to the surface. And 800 years ago, the Arabs called it Aina Damar, which means the fountain of tears. Los caballos negros son. Las herraduras son negras. Sobre las capas relucen manchas de tinta y de cera. Tienen. Por eso no lloran de plomo las calaveras. Con el alma de charol vienen por la carretera. Jorobados y nocturnos. Por donde Aníbal ordenan silencios de goma oscura. Y miedos de fina arena. Pasan. Si quieren pasar. Y ocultan en la cabeza una vaga astronomía de pistolas inconcretas. ¡Oh ciudad de los gitanos! En las esquinas banderas. La luna y la calabaza con las guindas en conserva. ¡Oh ciudad de los gitanos! ¿Quién te vio y no te recuerda? Ciudad de dolor y almizcle con las torres de canela. We are Mounties! Come, river or blizzard! The first thing I did in my life when I got my first mini cassette was to take a cassette of the records, of that record. Playing, uh, accompanying La Argentinita. La Argentinita. And you can hear Federico's voice sometimes. Can you? Yeah. There's a moment when he says something like, oh, oh like that. I, I haven't heard that. You haven't heard that? That's, that's the imagination of no. a crazy Lorca scholar. You think so? <laughs> yeah, everybody says that he gave himself fully to the friendship of the moment. He has many friends also who never met him. Mm -hmm. Because That's we true. never met him and we love him. Mm -hmm. We could have been, perhaps, very good friends of him. Yes. I, I'm sure I, I could have been a very close friend to Lorca. <laughs> <laughs> and you too? Yes, I'm not so sure about myself. No? No, I think no. he would have found me a bit... Uh, academic. A bit, bit, bit academic, oh, perhaps, no, and a bit on. rough. <laughs> a bit Irish. Well. <laughs> 